On Saturday the 25th of March 2006, photographer Bob Carlos Clark checked himself out of the Priory Hospital in London where he was being treated for clinical depression. Despite being an in-demand photographer who had created many successful ad campaigns throughout the 80s and 90s, he was depressed at the thought of himself getting older. Most of all, he was doubting his own talents. Shunned by the National Portrait Gallery, at least in his mind, and the tastemakers of photography, the critics, the creators and the writers who decide whose work should be fated and whose work should be dismissed. It was in this dark frame of mind that Bob Carlos Clark was walking the streets of southwest London when he came to a train line at a level crossing. Bob Carlos Clark is best known for his beautifully toned and tinted black and white photographs of rubber clad women. He also created real life images and portraits of celebrities and eventually established himself as a reputation as an extremely versatile photographer and an exceptional printmaker. I was first introduced to the work of Bob Carlos Clark through the pages of Amateur Photographer, where Bob used to write articles for, for them and, and give us insights into the world of a, you know, of a professional photographer. And he used to recount a story, and one of these has, has stuck with me throughout the years, and it's this, the story about this, this, to my mind, quite an iconic image of Bob Carlos Clark's. And he was in the cemetery in Putney Vale with this model who she was tired and she was cold and unhappy with just standing around in, in the fading light, dressed only in this skin-tight rubber dress. Just that very morning, her fiancé had cancelled their wedding and the last thing that she really wanted to do was to be photographed. So eventually, you know, the shoot wasn't going too well and, and Bob Carlos Clark asked her what she wanted to do and, and her response was that all she wanted to do was cry. So, cry she did. And we ended up with this beautifully haunting and melancholy photograph that once you've seen it just this sticks in your mind. Initially he achieved much success with his large glossy coffee table book. It's in these books that you see fantastic examples of this hand tinting process that Bob Carlos Clark had arrived at by his experiences in, a, in the very small and cramped darkroom that he set up initially, where the, the table would collapse on itself occasionally, the, the rumble of the train going past would, would shake the, the enlarger and he would have to time it so that, the, you know, that he could get sharp-ish prints, that, that errant hoses would end up spraying chemistry everywhere within the darkroom. And it, it ended up with this approach, what Bob Carlos Clark calls brutalizing his photographs. And I love this idea that, this, that, that it becomes a very organic process that you don't really see very often today in, in the world of, of digital. Bob Carlos Clark said that he made more money from selling his property than he ever did from his photography. But he was always aware of the importance of remaining sensible about his commercial viability. And he said that magazines required not art, but just pictures of a sexy, sultry girl. He said, there's no point in being arty, there's no point in doing strange lighting or funny props because they just won't run the photographs and consequently he won't get paid. Bob Carlos Clark was most proud of his documentary photography that he created in the book White Heat, which was about Harvey's Kitchen in the late 1980s, featuring the, the up and coming, then up and coming, Marco Pierre White, which focused not on the dishes that Pierre White was creating, but all on, on the, everything that surrounded them, this, this crazy, frantic world that, that Bob felt echoed his own life in the darkroom quite, quite neatly. This alchemy for creating something from nothing and the photographs that, that Bob Carlos Clark produced during this period with, with this book, they set the tone for this hard living, tormented celebrity chef that we're so familiar with today. And of course, propelled the book White Heat into the bestsellers list. The body of work that Bob Carlos created throughout his career was original, was diverse, challenging, and, and often very beautiful. You can't walk past or see one of his photographs without having an emotion of some description. They are arresting, if nothing else. They're not really the sort of photographs that one would hang on the wall. Even his simple photographs of the stones on the beach, the twisted fork and the spoon, these contain the same sort of feeling that Robert Maplethorpe's flowers had. 
occasionally his photographs can fall flat and they can just be a, you know a one-trick pony but at their very best his sumptuous photos reflect this inner struggle and a turmoil that that Bob Carlos Clark felt throughout his entire life and certainly about his career as a photographer. Bob Carlos Clark's insight into the world of photography I think is extremely candid and we can take a lot from this insight that he gave us and one of those things is that he was always a realist he was aware of the fickleness of fashions in photography and that his own work was difficult it can be controversial and it was at the mercy of cultural and social changes he realized that he wanted to become a photographer who could survive and to do so he needed to do a little bit of everything so you see his work cropping up advertising cars editorial fashion spirit jeans all sorts of things he felt that becoming known for just one thing was far too dangerous and that those photographers who are known for a specific thing invariably run the risk of falling out of fashion themselves. He felt the secret of success was to be as self-pleasing as possible, to do things just because you want to do them. Like Henri Cartier-Bresson, Jacques Henri Lutrigue and Robert Frank, the greatest photographers are the ones who don't photograph anyone but themselves. Like most photographers, he wanted not only to be successful, wealthy and admired, but also wanted to have the respect of his peer group and, and other photographers to have this, this validation. Bob Carlos Clark understood that at the heart of his photography were the ghosts and memories of events past. As he became older, these ghosts took on more of a, a gripping hold in his mind. He felt that his work somehow was no longer relevant. He wasn't in as demand as he was in the 80s and 90s for commercial photography. He was unhappy with the advent of digital that was rising up and he felt was kind of cheapening the art form of photography. Like a lot of photographers and, and artists who are exceptionally talented, he held himself to a really high standard that was completely unattainable and of course failed to recognize the, the recognition that he was getting from his peer group. Eventually, all of this struggle had become too much to bear, and on that Saturday, almost 15 years ago, Bob Carlos Clark stood beside that level crossing in southwest London, took a fatal step, and was hit by a passing train. In the days following his suicide, almost as if to rub salt into these emotional wounds of being unrecognized in his lifetime by the National Portrait Gallery, a portrait of Bob by his 14-year-old daughter Scarlett was put on display there just days after his death. It wouldn't be until 2013 that his photography would be collected by the National Portrait Gallery.